What's up, guys? It's Matt with the Redshirt Army Podcast Network. Uh, just going to do a kind of in-depth tutorial in uh, a couple of parts, probably two pieces, uh, for Path of Exile. Because I know it's uh, kind of overwhelming for new players, especially those that have never played an action RPG. Uh, Poe is pretty much uh, set in a genre along the lines of Diablo, Baldur's Gate, Torchlight, and several others. Uh, it's basically hack and slash with a lot of awesome loot and great combat. Uh, so looking at your class selection, uh, you've got your basic three. Uh, your Marauder is your pure strength, your Ranger is pure dex, and your Witch is pure intelligence. Then your hybrid classes are your Templar, your Shadow, and your Duelist, which uh, kind of follow a dual path of uh, two primary stats that they split focus upon. And the freedom in the game lets you pretty much pick any class and kind of do what you want, which we'll get into here in a minute and go through. Uh, just for this run through, I'm just going to pick a ranger, just because it's quick and easy to show off at the very beginning. Uh, so we're going to do a little name here, and that'll be fine. Now, uh, the basic backstory, real quick, just a little bit of it, not to get too in depth with backstory, uh, is you are a prisoner that was sentenced to death, and you're exiled on an island called Rayclast. And let me tell you that the island is not friendly, and there's plenty of shit that will kill you. So you pretty much spawn on a beach, and you gotta kill a zombie, and that pretty much starts it off. Uh, now the first thing you notice that dropped is a burning arrow skill gem. And you can hold down alt, just like in previous games, to show loot on the ground. Now, skills in this game vary in how they are done. They're not like other games where you put points in a, a tree necessarily to give you abilities. They're done with gems. And the great thing that Path of Exile has done really well is the skill system with gems is completely flexible. Now this is a burning arrow skill gem which obviously is a activated ability for uh, casting or firing a burning arrow and you can slot it into an item that matches the same color. Uh, red for strength, green for dexterity, blue for intelligence. Now the great thing is you can re-slot these at any time. Just, you know, right-click it out of the item, and then put it into another item, stash it, sell it to someone else. It's not permanently stuck, which is great. That lets you mix and match a lot. And the various items come with uh, a variety of different number of sockets, socket colors, if they're linked to sockets, which we'll get into later, and more so. Now, I'm just going to go ahead and run through the little beginning, because you don't start in the Act 1 town like you would another ARPG. You kind of have to fight your way through this little <clears throat> tutorial area, and uh, I'm just going to pass over all the mobs and chests and get straight to it, because once you get to town, you have to fight a little mini-boss. And uh, he's not overly difficult, and you don't really need to like kind of power level through the tutorial to be able to defeat him. Uh, it's just, you know, sort of like a uh, just a little introduction to town. And he should be coming up right there. There's Hillock. And as you can see, you know, he's not overly difficult. He's just, you know, your basic little lumbering guy that I'm going to set on fire by casting my Burning Arrow, which is bound to right-click. And I can, you know, go in and change any of my other keys to Burning Arrow if I want, which is nice. You're not limited to just left and right-click. And my mana is running out. And we're going to use a flask. Now, the potion system in this game is not like a traditional potion system in another game or pots. Uh, they're not just, you know, health and mana. They come in other flavors like vials and different things. But they don't get completely consumed upon use. As you saw when I used my health flask, it regenerated some of my health, but it didn't totally consume the flask. The flask system is actually also very flexible in Poe in that it doesn't auto use up the entire thing. By fighting and killing regular mobs or going back to town, it'll refill your flasks. Now obviously going back to town, to instantly refill them is the easiest way, but you're not always going to want to take a town portal back to town every single time you run out of flasks, which is nice by killing other just random enemies. And there goes the mini boss down, he dropped some items, nothing I really need, and I'll head on over into town. 
Now, flasks can also have stats on them, too, which is nice. Uh, benefits to the flask, like, uh, you know, plus more quality or quantity of how much it's redu er, increased, you know, how much you regen, the f speed of what you regen, all of that. So it's really nice to have other flasks. And this is Anak 1 Town. There's only a couple of basic NPCs and some others. And I've already got quests to pick up that will lead you into the rest of the game. Now, as for some of the other basics, you do get skill gems from completing some quests. Uh, some of them will be useful for whatever build you're going with. Others won't. I'll go ahead and pick up Lightning Arrow just to have it. And uh, as you can see, you can purchase armor and stuff from the various NPCs. Now, the shops are very limited in what they offer. Every time you visit an NPC shop, it is not going to automatically reset. Because, like, if I close the window here and go back, it's the same items. The only time that the shop refreshes is every time you gain a new level. All NP shops refresh what items they offer, and every 24 hours of game time, shops will refresh. So even if you log out for the day and don't come back and level up anymore, 24 hours later, the shops will refresh. Now, the stash system is very nice. As you can see, I've been playing pull a lot, so I've been uh, hoarding all of my stuff for alts and other characters. Uh, you get a default of four stash tabs that have uh, quite a bit of room, uh, personally, if you ask me, and it's a shared stash. So everything on your account that you put in here can be accessed by other characters on your account, which is very nice. Now, with only four stash tabs, you know, you're thinking, well, eventually you're going to run out of space, right, if you fill them all up and everything. That is true, but one of the things about Poe, since Poe will be a free-to-play game once it's actually done released and out of closed beta, is they will offer what they call ethical microtransactions. Uh, if you've ever played any other free-to-play games, a lot of times they're kind of under or over balanced with their cash shop. Uh, they either sell too much useful stuff that you should be able to obtain in-game or not enough. Uh, so to make it not so pay-to-win and to make it more balanced, uh, they're offering mainly cosmetic changes for, like, armor and skills and functionality for, like, stash and character slots. So you can use for, or, uh, cash out currency to buy more stash tabs if you want or more character slots if you want more characters, uh, which I think the default is 24, I believe, off the top of my head. So if you're really into hoarding items and everything else, don't worry, you can buy more than four stash slots if you want. And uh, I've, this is just me collecting skill gems and various doodads. And you're probably thinking, well, how do you get all of this other than NPCs? <clears throat> well, there is trading currently. Uh, there is no official trading window between two players. Uh, so you have to go the old school Diablo 1 route, where you both have to drop an item on the ground and go over and pick it up. Um, personally, I haven't run into any scammers that'll try to cheat me. So I've had success doing that, but they are working on an official trade window in a future patch. And the main form of currency in this game is there is none. Uh, as you've probably noticed, there are no gold coins or any other form of coin currency or cash or anything like that. Pretty much the basic items are your currency. Your scrolls of wisdom, uh, which are basically a scroll of identify to identify loot that drops. And your town portal scrolls are the two most basic forms of currency. Like if you go over to an NPC and you want to buy, okay, here's a ring I want to buy. This ring costs me three scrolls of wisdom. I can buy that. And without any gold or, you know, coin currency, it really defeats the purpose of gold farmers and gold selling websites because there's no set prices on items. You know, if I find a really good item like this axe, like if I wanted to sell this axe, you know, I, I can't just go and buy coins and go buy the axe. I have to barter with another player to get, you know, the item I want. You know, offer them something, they counter-offer, and then, you know, you barter your way through, which is a very nice and unique system. And the other primary source of currency are the various orbs, as you see here. Orbs all do uh, different things. Either they can increase an item, like this one will take a magic item and give it a new random suffix or prefix, or the Orb of Chance, which takes just a normal item and can uh, make it a random magic or a random rare, uh, you know, Chaos Orb, it takes a rare item and just completely redoes all the stats, uh, you know, all of these have value in what they do. 
Um, some are obviously worth more than others, like the, the Gem Cutter's Prism improves the quality of a gem, so you can actually take a gem and make it better than what it is, you know, adds more damage or other factors. And some of the orbs have a drop rate that's very common, like armor or scrap. You know, there's a reason why there's 27 of those and only two gym cutters in my stash is because armor or scrap drops far more often than gym cutters. So those do kind of add a hierarchy of orb trading and value for the barter system. Some people will place more value on one orb over another, so you have to kind of barter it out. And there are pretty neat little different orbs. Uh, basically, you can take like the orb of scouring and just remove everything from an item and just start clean. Uh, I don't have one in my inventory yet, but there's also like an orb of regret, which offers you a skill point refund for respecking, which uh, is kind of going to lead us into the other main thing I wanted to kind of show off. And this is going to be the most daunting thing new players see, and that is this sucker right here. That is the passive skill tree window. And yes, that is legitimately insane. Uh, some previous games, like in the Final Fantasy series and such, have had a similar skill tree, uh, but not too many. And it is very overwhelming at first to a new player. You see this and basically shit your pants and go, oh my god, what am I going to do with this? The main differences in the six classes is where they start out on the tree. So as a ranger, I kind of start out over on this side. And, you know, I can branch out. Every time you gain a level, you gain one skill point that you can put in. And the passive skill tree is exactly as I just described, passive. There are no active skills that you gain from this. You know, I can get more attack speed, you know, a straight up dexterity bonus, uh, you know, various other things, you know, increased evasion. And the more and more you go, there's tons of options. You can literally make a ranger that casts spells if you work your way up the tree to a more intelligence-based or, you know, whatever you want to do. You may sacrifice a few points to get where you're going, but you can have a lot of freedom with choosing your skills. Uh, the bigger skill nodes, as you see, those generally add a much more help, uh, beefier increase. Like, some will be just, you know, straight up like 30 dexterity instead of six or ten. And then you have your keystones, which is the really big ones, the really big nodes. Those offer very huge, as someone in uh, local chat says, yeah, ignore him. Uh, there's a lot of debate over that. We don't like to discuss D3 in comparison, but keystones add very specific abilities that are, you know, could be good and could be bad based upon what build you do. And uh, there's very few of them. I mean, there's only a handful that are around the tree. A lot of them are on the outer edges, as you can see. And uh, some of them are pretty good. Iron Reflexes is great. Basically, any of your armor pieces that add evasion rating, which is dodging, it converts it all into straight armor points. So you can get some high armor that has, you know, a lot of evasion and armor and just convert it all straight into armor for armor stacking. And... There's all kinds of builds you can work in through keystones and everything else. So if you're looking at this and you know thinking, how in the world do I navigate this? How do I do it? Just play and just try and see what works. There's also a, a virtual skill tree planner at the pathofexile.com website that you can go with and kind of pre-plan your build and uh, look at things out. Uh, the skill cap of the game is uh, 100 levels, so you'll get 100 points from that, and you also get some skill points from completing certain quests, so grand total it's around 111 points that you can spend, which uh, can give you quite a lot to pick up on the tree. So uh, just keep that in mind as you try to plan down the road ahead, and uh, just don't let it overwhelm you, you know? Play several characters, play around with the tree, and uh, see where that goes. And uh, we'll go over some more of the basics in part two and show you how to get through with a party, how to get into various different instances of a zone, the waypoint system, and more. So if you want to check that out or any other videos or content we do, you can check out our website at redshirtarmy.com or our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash redshirtarmypodcast. And uh, we'll see you guys on the next episode.